In this video I'm asking a lot of questions. Questions like, what happened to the Commodore PET smartphone? Questions like, what's this new Commodore computer that I keep seeing on social media? And questions like, who actually owns the Commodore brand? Because it seems a bit chaotic. Think back to 2015. Come on, it's a lot more recent than I usually ask of you. And some saddened part of your mind will probably remember this. This is, or was, the Commodore PET smartphone. And by July of that year, 2015, images of it had been swirling around already for a few months. The Facebook page Commodore Business Machines first posted in December 2014 using this imagery. Some kind of weird 3D phone render. I think it's a fan art piece. Commodore smartphone, you have no choice. <laughs> Jesus Christ. But just a few months later, after trying to increase hype and interest in their page through lots of Commodore 64 photographs, promises of a new phone appeared. Now, using the power of archive.org, if you look at the website commodore-pet.com from around that time, you'll find this imagery along with words like a brand new and powerful mobile device from Commodore Business Machines. And it features near the best hardware technology available on the smartphone market worldwide. Hmm, interesting. From the go, people were questioning this new Commodore brand that seemingly popped up out of nowhere, and apparently, judging from the language, was based from Italy. But hype is hype, and a number of people were convinced enough to take the plunge and order this new, branded phone. Mentally, I cast this whole debacle aside, but the question that's been niggling me is, did anyone actually receive one? Because look around YouTube now, and there's hardly any videos about them, and this is something that you'd expect to be all over YouTube and social media. People love talking about shiny new things, especially when they have pointless rebrands. Talking of which, wouldn't you like a shiny new IP address to use from time to time? Because this segment's sponsor, Private Internet Access, offer just that. I'm not going to bore you with how a VPN works. You already know how important they are for securing your identity, data, or access to geo-restricted content. I've even used it in the investigations of this video because your IP address is logged everywhere, even when sending emails. It's vital that your location and your data are kept secure. Private Internet Access is a secure VPN provider with over 30 million downloads around the world. They have a proven no-logs policy, they have 20,000 VPN servers in over 70 countries, and it's available on Windows, Mac, iOS, Android, Amazon Fire Stick, and Linux. As a special discount, you can get this for three years for the equivalent of just over $2 a month. Plus, you get two months free and a 30-day money-back guarantee. For better security, check out the link below. The main review you can find for this phone is by Scene World magazine, who was sent a model for review purposes. And even then, it wasn't in the best of shape. Just look at that box. But they clearly had the Commodore branded phone, and it worked. You can tell from this video that it's running Android Lollipop, it has a Commodore themed wallpaper, and a few apps which have been installed to give that Commodore badge some credence. Namely, Anvi 64 and the Amiga emulator UAE for All, which are available for free download from the Play Store. Although these are slightly customised releases apparently, featuring the Commodore logo. The Vice application creator confirmed in 2015 to AndroidPolice.com that they were asked to modify the original app for this specific purpose. Although Cloanto, who owned the Amiga and ROM rights, also confirmed that they hadn't consented to the distribution of their materials on the smartphone. So I decided to reach out to Scene World and find out what the crack was. I had a chat with Jörg, who informed me that they had done an exclusive interview with what they call Commodore Italy for their podcast. As part of this interview, they requested two review phone units, but only received one. 
So, Jörg had to ship his review copy to AJ in America, who then did the main review video. The gents being interviewed in the podcast are an Italian duo, Massimo Canagiani and Paolo Bessa. Uh, we are all very fond of the old Commodore. Uh, we all had uh, a Commodore or more Commodore computer in the past. Uh, as you can see, Behind me, I have uh, some uh, Commodore uh, uh, gadgets as well. And uh, so we decided, why not? Uh, if we can, uh, why shouldn't we try to uh, make this uh, a great uh, brand name live again in uh, a new sector where the technology actually is uh, today? Paolo Bessa, acting as general manager, does most of the talking as Massimo, the main guy behind the outfit, isn't a strong English speaker. Now, this interview took place on the 25th of December 2015, so the phones had already been on sale a few months, but they sound credible and genuinely excited. And you really get the feeling that they're trying to do something with a brand that stuck with them since childhood. And this seemed to also come across in interviews on websites and the wider media, including prominent publications both in English and other European languages. This was an exciting and emerging Commodore situation, and no one was more excited than the Italian media themselves. Here's an excerpt from the publication Gazzetta di Mantova. The key to success Having discovered that the historic logo, the C with the red-blue flag, was released after the 1994 Commodore bankruptcy. That's despite the changes in ownership of the company and industrial patents, because for five years it had not been linked to any production. Caninjani did not think about it for a moment, and on May 20, 2015, he requested and obtained the exclusive right to use the figurative trademark from the European Union Patent Office with only 1,900 euros, registering it in 38 countries, including the United States. So, on the face of it, this sounds credible, but I wanted to dig a little deeper. Scene World, themselves, were pretty sure this wasn't a scam or anything underhand at all. They knew of people who had received phones and understood that complaints were followed up. Now, Scene World run a very decent podcast, so I have no doubt about the veracity of their belief, but this was all conducted during the initial media run, when facts were thin on the ground. Thankfully, the gift of time gives us more data. In the comments of their review video, there are a couple of people claiming to have received a phone, but there are also a few fair commenters with negative feedback. Positive feedback is a little on the thin side. You'd expect more. It's clear that most of those who did receive the phone had to wait a long time for it, sometimes it seems over half a year, and then most quickly realised that it was actually a very low-cost device shrouded in Commodore skin. If you take a look at devices such as the PC Box B and OrgTech WAF phone, you'll notice the distinct similarity. In fact, the OrgTech is a carbon copy in both specs and looks, save the branding. And the cost? about $130, sometimes cheaper. So the obvious assumption is that this so-called Commodore business machines had bought up some cheap devices and had them customised in China to fit the Commodore image. This is a pretty straightforward practice, and if you look on YouTube, you'll see a lot of people have done it, including the Wall Street Journal, who got a fully customised branded phone for $70. And there was a lot of noise about this sort of thing in 2015, around the time this was going on. How much were they charging again? Well, about 349 euros or 365 dollars. Okay, so that's a decent profit. But hey, there's nothing intrinsically wrong with that aspect. Companies are free to charge what they want, if the market will pay it. This is how capitalism works. But if the market doesn't receive the product they've paid for, then we have a problem. So, I decided to track down a few people who had at least confirmed receipt. Richard Troop was one of them. He told me, I think I finally got it four months after purchase. 
As for the phone itself, it didn't work well and was very buggy with constant crashes. They sent me a replacement handset and it was pretty much the same to the point where they replaced it with their newer Leo model. Honestly, that phone was much better and felt more premium. So things worked out for some people, even with apparently adequate customer service. On the other hand, there seemed to be a fair few people who didn't get a device at all. One such is Michael Fisher, AKA Mr. Mobile. Commodore phone? Yeah, I remember that. Back when I worked at Pocket Now in 2015, we dropped 380 something dollars to get a review device because they didn't have a reviews program. And I was stoked because the Commodore 64 was in fact my first computer. And then we never got one. And then I did a bunch of research and I found out that most people never got one. So I wrote an article, I asked for comment, never got any comment, and assumed the company would disappear. Well, it's like six years later and I guess they're still around. Are they shipping any products? I look forward to finding out. So it's a very mixed bag and more investigation is needed. So I decided to try and track down a device for myself and see what the situation is. After searching for a while, I was pointed in the right direction and although it cost me a pretty penny in both buying it and import costs, I managed to secure a Commodore PET smartphone. Let's take a look. So at least my box isn't ripped. It's a pretty standard box. We get a list of specifications on the back, an octa-core processor, 32 gigabytes of read-only memory apparently, I think they mean storage, three gigabytes of RAM, reasonable for the time. But what gets me right away is how much Commodore branding there really is. On the box, in the manual, on the battery, even on the inside of the headphones. The manual has been printed on a thick bit of paper and impotently folded down, but it does have a job. The phone doesn't feel like the most solid construction, but we do get dual SIM slots and everything fits together. It even turns on. So the battery can hold its charge well. I was not expecting that. I must say, it's a nice touch having the Commodore chicken head logo as the center button, but then this is all about branding. That's all this phone really has. Other than that, we're straight into Android Lollipop, which feels alarmingly outdated compared to what we currently have. And by the way, that's the standard Lollipop wallpaper with the Commodore logo just wanged in the middle. Now remember, these phones started shipping in late 2015, and with Android Marshmallow being released in May 2015, it would already have been slightly behind the times. I've also heard that people couldn't get it to update, which would have been quite annoying. But hey, in my limited test it seemed to work reasonably well. The Commodore 64 emulator throws you straight into Commodore Basic. I don't really like these weird touch control icons, they're a bit... What? They look like they're just out of place and confusing. The Amiga emulator brings up the standard Anvice screen and you can boot the machine into what appears to be the Aros Kickstart ROM, which is an open source alternative to the actual Amiga ROM. So that helps get around any legal issues with Cloanto. And that's it. That's what you get for your 349 euros. Or over double that in my case. An Android phone with a couple of apps and a load of branding, but at least it does actually exist. And if that's your thing, then you probably would have been happy with your purchase. Unless any issues cropped up in use, of course. If you remember, Richard told me that he was so disappointed with the pet that he managed to get the company to send him a follow-up model, the Leo. I suspect this is an instance where Richard's persistence paid off as I've found his comments strewn over various social media pages. Now, as you'd expect, the Leo is another Chinese Android which has been rebranded, but this one actually made it onto Amazon in some countries, albeit to very mixed reviews. But here's the German YouTube channel Crowfly showing off their model. 
So this appeared on the scene in late 2016, early 2017. For a more reasonable 249 euros, it was reviewed by a few tech sites to generally more favourable applause. So we've determined that these phones actually do exist. We've determined that some customers at least received them, and we've determined that the first model at least was a bit of a turd. But what about the legality of all of this? Remember Massimo's plan from earlier? That because the Commodore trademark hadn't been used for five years, then it was a fair game? Well, that applies in many areas, including Europe and the US. You have to keep using your trademarks or show intended use, otherwise they can be contested. Its aim is to prevent trademark squatting. It's also why we get seemingly the same superhero films every five years. As rights holders clamber to keep the IP in use. Now the Commodore brand had indeed been a bit quiet, so Massimo thought he saw a legal loophole and he was going to jump through it. Therefore his first port of call needed to be a local application. That meant going through the European Union Intellectual Property Office. And it's easy enough to do a search for that trademark using their online service. Here's what I found. What you're seeing here is the business name Massimo has registered. A UK business, Commodore Business Machines Limited of Wenlock Road, 20-22 London, which is the same address on the original website. And then under that is the figurative trademark registration filed on the 10th of April 2015. Now, figurative means a registration other than purely text. In this case, the Commodore logo with the name underneath. But you may notice the left C is aligned differently to what we're used to. I suspect this was a deliberate change to try and differentiate the mark very slightly from the original in the hope that it would help circumnavigate any sort of legal issues. And that's mainly because trademarks need to be pretty specific. And in fact, they kind of confirmed this themselves in a Facebook comment. However, it clearly hasn't worked because the registration was refused. Now, when you file for a trademark, there's a period known as the opposition period. This is usually a three month stretch of time immediately after filing where anyone can object to your registration, including companies who already own the trademark. Usually a trademark owner will have an alert system in place in case this sort of thing happens. So we can see on the 11th of August 2015, one day before they were home free, an opposition was indeed received on the grounds of likelihood of confusion. The opposition was filed by Merkin Bureau Nif and Partners BV, who are trademark attorneys based in the Netherlands. Their client? Well, it was the legal trademark holders of the Commodore brand. The proper ones. Now, the Commodore rights have been thrown about a bit, but the core of it is Tulip Computers bought the Commodore brand name in 97. It was then sold to various related sub-companies, becoming Commodore Inc. and Commodore International BV, who tried to bring us a line of Commodore branded gaming PCs in the mid to late noughties before becoming Commodore Licensing BV and then C Holdings. They're still based out of Rusendal in the Netherlands, and you may find on some documents they go under the name of NetBV or something similar. These are in fact other companies under the same wing, and they're managed by a company called Yams Holding BV, operated by Eugene Van Os. The actual Commodore specific operation is now called Commodore Corporation BV and holds all global and licensing rights to the Commodore brand. Now, this ownership was contested when parts of the former Tulip computers were bought out in 2009 by the Hong Kong based Asia Rim Corporation, who had been trying to use the branding for keyboards and the like, but ultimately remains in the Netherlands as this 2014 legal report verifies. Asia Rim Corporation hereby states and publicly acknowledges and accepts that C Holdings BV is the sole and exclusive owner of the Commodore trademarks and brand name. 
Azurim further states that C Holdings' exclusive ownership of the Commodore trademarks was adjudged and confirmed by the United States District Court for the Southern District of New York in its memorandum and order dated December the 16th, 2013. So back to this opposition by Commodore International. If we take a look, you can see the contested territory is the United Kingdom and the original trademark is a text trademark, which gives you more flexibility in legal proceedings because this also contains the word Commodore and it has a mark associated with Commodore. Now, another factor when filing a trademark is what category it's in or classification. For example, if you look in the UK's Intellectual Property Office database, you'll find a registered trademark here for the word Commodore in Class 28. Class 28 relates to fishing tackle and nets for anglers, not an area Commodore computers should ever find themselves in, and so that class can be registered to a different company. But you also need to state the specifics in each class. So Commodore Business Machines Limited has tried to register for Class 9 smartphones, hoping that it won't be contested by Commodore Corporation or Commodore Holdings as they then were. But if you look at the British IPO, you can see that Commodore is already registered to Class 9 for Commodore Holdings through the associated company NetBV. And even though they don't specify smartphones, which, you know, given how old the registration is, is fair enough, the use is comparable enough to computers. It's on this basis that the trademark was refused and Commodore Business Machines of Italy were left without usage rights. At least, that's what it seems. At this point, the five-year clause wasn't even contested. Further to this, Commodore Holdings, as it was then known, issued a press release on the 7th of August 2015, stating that C Holdings BV hereby announces that it has not granted any rights to CBM for making use of the Commodore trademark. Nor that C Holdings BV has any involvement in the development and marketing of its products. C Holdings BV will vigorously defend its rights in this matter. Despite this, Commodore Business Machines brashly posted on their Facebook page stating, Commodore wishes to inform that it is in no way affiliated or related to C Holding BV and confirms to be the only legitimate owner of the figurative brand Commodore in its business sector, smartphones. Commodore Business Machines wishes to assert to its customers, partners, media and fans that all the ongoing activities will regularly proceed as planned, as they will not suffer any variation of delay due to this circumstance. So then, clearly a small technical matter like ownership wasn't going to stop Commodore Business Machines from pressing ahead with selling the Commodore PET smartphone. And indeed, some six years on, their new website still states, in the year 2015, Commodore Business Machines Limited obtained the Commodore brand rights within 38 countries all over the world to build and sell smartphones and accessories. It's just like they completely refused to recognize the decision bestowed upon them and chose not to care about any threat of any legal proceedings. This Italian has big balls, clearly. So let's dig a little deeper into the business listed at the bottom of these websites because for some reason it's registered in the UK. From 2015, all the websites and literature point back to Commodore Business Machines Limited at 20-22 Wenlock Road, London. Now that's a UK registered company which is a little strange for an Italian operation and actually looking into the business gets even stranger. So, firstly, you need to understand that registering a limited company in the UK is a lot easier than most European countries. There's actually very little bureaucracy and constraints around it here. As long as you have a registered address, which could be a virtual office or even just a mailing address, and you're not barred from being a director, you're pretty much good to go. It's also very easy to dissolve a company and strike off its assets. So if your business goes down the pan, you can dissolve it and start another one. Hmm, <laughs> yeah. So we've got three companies here, all called Commodore Business Machines Limited, 
So already that's a bit odd and quite curious. The first one was incorporated on the 3rd of March 2015, just one month before they applied for the trademark. As a business with no specific nature, it has one director, that's Dr. Massimo Canagiani, and he's listed the same business address as his correspondence address. That address, I should note, is a virtual address. It's owned by the Made Simple Company Registration Service, so for the princely sum of £19.99, you can register a company through them and then use their address for your business. You see, I told you it was easy. In fact, in 2016, several bogus companies using the same address were liquidated by the courts on the grounds of public interest. So on the 3rd of March, the company had one pound in capital shares and one shareholder. Although it's not Massimo, it's actually someone called Carlo Scatolini, who seems to be a writer and law graduate based in Italy. Now, interestingly, on the 11th of June 2015, just when the phones were first being promoted, an extra £1 million of shares were injected into the company. Well, on paper, at least. I couldn't tell you if it was actually in their bank account, as that information isn't publicly available. Typically, this action is done to make a company appear more credible to the outside world, but there are other reasons. What I can tell you is that on the 23rd of August 2016, just over a year later, the company was dissolved. What that means is it didn't exist anymore. Interestingly, this was one month before the company's first annual report was due. This is a legally required report submitted to company's house detailing how much revenue the business has made, how many assets it holds, etc, etc. For new companies, the first report is due 18 months after incorporation. Now, being dissolved, this would typically mean that any assets the company owns are now owned by the Crown. But if any cash had been extracted before that point, such as dividends or expenses or anything else really, you know, either taken out personally or sent to another company or anything like that, then there's not much to take ownership of. So if you had ordered a phone through this company and hadn't received it by this date, you are not likely to get it. Also, say perhaps you wanted to sue the company, you probably won't be able to do that now it's closed either. But at this point, Commodore business machines were still seemingly shipping out their new Leo phone regardless of the legal registered status of their business. They had also moved on to a different trademark approach. Rather than trying to register the Commodore logo to a company, they tried to register it to themselves as individuals, again through the European Union Intellectual Property Office. I should note that once you've registered a trademark to yourself or any legal entity really, you can sell or transfer the rights to wherever you want. Now again, the registration class is for nine, but expanded to include digital televisions as well as tablet computers. But they also came bearing a new figurative mark. Does it look familiar in any way at all? I mean, that bears some resemblance to the instantly recognisable Commodore C mark, but with plain and simple CBM underneath, thereby potentially circumventing the Commodore wordmark opposition from their previous filing. This new filing occurred on the 12th of July 2016. By the 2nd of November, an opposition had been received by Commodore Holdings. The oppositions for this dragged on for quite a while, three years to be precise, but by the 14th of January 2019, the trademark was... Well, it was actually granted to Massimo and Carlo Scatolini. Pretty crazy. Why? Well, it was argued this time around that Commodore had failed to make adequate use of their figurative C trademark, specifically in the five years prior to the application despite their claims to the contrary. Because Commodore Business Machines had gone in this time with a figurative mark free of the Commodore text itself, they were able to convince the court of their case. Commodore Holdings had tried to claim that the mark had been used in various implementations, including a licensed iPhone application by the mobile game maker 
Manomio, but it was decided that the logo was, quote, hardly perceptible in some of the examples. This, combined with arguments over European territories the app was used in, proved unsubstantial to oppose the registration. So, a win to the Italians this time. Although using the Commodore name itself might be a bit tricky, and it gets even more tricky in a bit. But for now, they had a trademark. So then, roll on 25th of February 2019, and Commodore Business Machines Limited is back. Same address, same director, but a more specific nature of business. Manufacture of men's underwear. Manufacture of consumer electronics, activities of real estate investment trusts, and administration of financial markets. Interesting choices. Again, the same people are involved and the business is dissolved this time on the 5th of January 2021. Again, seemingly without fulfilling their legal obligations of submitting any annual reports. Now, by the 13th of December 2018, Commodore Holdings had just emerged after appeal from a separate legal battle with a company known as Trademarkers NV. Trademarkers NV had filed their own application on the 26th of September 2014 to invalidate Commodore Holdings Commodore Trademark for lack of genuine use for a continuous period of five years. Now, Trademarkers NV has a bit of a track record with this sort of thing. But given the timings, this, I suspect, is the case where Massimo got the basis for his idea. However, by the end of 2018, Commodore Holdings had come out victorious by arguing that forced legal battles with Asia Rim had tied up their ability to use their own trademarks. And so, Commodore Holdings were now intent on setting things straight. The first was to register C. Commodore on the 25th of October 2019 with the EU, which was granted on the 18th of January 2021, although not without an opposition by Massimo and Carlo, on the grounds of, yeah, you guessed it, likelihood of confusion, just like Commodore Holdings had done with them way back in 2015. The difference is, Commodore Holdings, through the company Palab Holding NV, this time retained the mark. Helped in part by their representation through Givers, a prominent European IP specialist. During the same period, Commodore Holdings also registered the C logo, again with a failed opposition from Massimo and Carlo. Crucially, these two marks were only registered to classes 25 for clothing, footwear and headgear, and 38 for telecommunications. Although the latter puts them in a pretty good stead to legally retaliate on the Class 9 smartphone use, trademark law is incredibly complex and the crossover of classes is just one element. But the most important registration here is that Commodore Holdings re-registered the Commodore wordmark to classes 9, 25, 38 and 42, 42 being computer software consulting services and the like. This registration was not opposed by our now infamous Italian duo and was registered to Commodore Holdings on the 19th of February 2020, again via Palab Holding NV. Now this should complicate things even further for our Italian Commodore business machines if, and only if, they play by the rules, that is. Which brings us to the current business incorporated on the 9th of April 2021. This time we get a different address entirely and the nature of business is manufacture of consumer electronics, construction of commercial buildings, television program production activities and administration of financial markets. Again, Massimo is the director, but we get a different corresponding address, this time based in Italy. And even better, another shareholder. It's our friend Paolo Bessa from earlier. You, you remember the general manager from the first interview. Now he's holding 40% of the business control compared to Massimo's 60%. Now I've tried to contact Massimo numerous times throughout this investigation, but he seems incredibly evasive. Paolo, however, is much more amicable. I asked him on LinkedIn what his current involvement is and he confirmed he's acting as a technical advisor, helping with development of Commodore products. 
I didn't ask him if he was aware of the company structure or anything like that, as communication was still on the slow side. But interestingly, Paolo has a Patreon page dedicated to his Amiga inspired operating system, Icarus Desktop. And this is actually a proper OS. It's open source, it's free, and is a re-implementation of Amiga OS 3. And I intend to check it out in more detail in a future video. But I also thought it might be an interesting factor regarding the business, but we'll get back to that later. Anyway, by now we've been through almost as many companies as we have trademarks, and that's not even counting CBM's website, which jumped from Commodore-Pet.com to Commodore-Smart.com to Commodore-CBM.com to finally CommodoreCompany.com. This business is like a blooming frog. And it's almost like they've preempted me looking into the business registration details. From 2015, the Commodore Group has been continuously upgraded, and new companies have been created in different nations to better meet the needs of the market and distribution. Oh right, yes, that explains it, of course. So what's the anchor for all these businesses? Where do they feed back to? What's the mothership? Well, if you take that address from the current UK business registration, it actually traces back to an Italian company called Commodore Business Machines, SRL. What a complex web we have here. This company was set up in March 2016 by Massimo with Carlo Scatolini as the managing director and with a share capital of €10,000. It has also submitted financial statements up to the 31st of December 2018 at least, by which point it held €98,876 in equity, but had reported a loss for previous years of 2408 in 2017 and 27137 in 2018, so this appears to be the main Italian operation. I'm not going to speculate anything regarding this balance sheet, I feel like I've dived deep enough already without disseminating a business's finances. It's publicly available for download from the Italian business register, so if you want, you can take a look and come to your own conclusions. But what's crucial is they're still operating, and of course they have that trademark, which brings me on to what they claim to be their latest product, the Commodore 64 GK. What in the world is this? If you look back through the Instagram account for Commodore Business Machines, still bearing the name Commodore Smart, you'll find lots of images of smartphones mixed with images pulled from around the web, but you'll also find this extended Commodore 64 keyboard mock-up. Now this was posted on the 20th of May 2020, but it's actually an image from Danamania on Im Imju, however you pronounce that site, of a fabrication added to their collection but it's almost like that image and the interest around it planted a seed because by January the 29th, 2021, we have this post. Coming soon, 2021. I'm not just a keyboard or console. Well, what the hell are you then? Because even at this stage, it looks like these keys have just been glued to a plastic shell. There's definitely no holes to cut to depress them into, and that keyboard is just a generic cheapo PC keyboard, but this is clearly an early prototype, so you know, it's fair enough, whatever it is. Over on Facebook, there are claims about a new computer system, so maybe it's that. Over on Twitter, we can see that some Commodore logos have presumably either been stuck or photoshopped onto the keys, whilst over on Massimo's personal Twitter, we get a photo of a 3D printed case, but this one does at least have holes to put keys into. The images of this cycle are just a selection, the base of a more complex work. Your feedback is important. You asked us for the colors and fonts of the keys, and that every detail is perfect. Who, who is asking for this stuff? What, what's going on? It's clear that they're trying to build hype, but at this point it's just all very odd. We get some images, presumably taken in an electrical retailer, to give it that commercial vibe, 
We get keys that change, sometimes they're blurred out, some angles even show there are holes in the case, but the keys don't even remotely fit into them. This enter key even appears to have warping damage of some description. And then we also get a box thrown into the equation, which then gets its own little tour of the world for photo shoots. A white model then appears in July with a completely different keyboard. So what is this thing? Well, I suspect at this stage it's very little. I asked Paolo if he would confirm details, but as yet haven't received a reply to that one. So all we can do is wait to see what Commodore Business Machines Limited tell us it is, and then decide how to feel about it. I actually thought this could explain Paolo Besser's involvement, if perhaps they're planning on plonking Icarus Desktop into a new Commodore branded machine. But that's one thing he flat out denied, stating that Icarus Desktop will have no connection to Commodore products at all. Like I said earlier, I also reached out to the contacts I could find for Commodore Business Machines and Massimo himself to get some information on, well, everything here, and to get his views on the trademark debacle. But as yet, all those requests have gone unanswered. Clearly, at this stage, I thought it prudent to do something I should have done earlier and double check that Massimo or Commodore Business Machines haven't registered a trademark exclusively in Italy. So, turns out they haven't, but I see that Commodore International BV, yet another pseudonym for Commodore Corporation, did shortly after their European trademark opposition. Better to be safe than sorry. But wait, what's this? Another Commodore trademark registration? What, what is this? Oh God. No, it's happening again, folks. Yep, in 2019, another Italian company waving the Commodore logo appeared. Now, this company actually managed to get the trademark registered in Italy. Not Europe, just Italy. How did they do that? Well, it's all down to those classifications of business. In this case, Commodore Engineering, set up by Luigi Simonetti, is claiming to be a services business having registered in classes 35, 41, and 42 with this figurative mark. So class 35 is advertising and business services, class 41 is for education and entertainment, sports activities, and class 42 is scientific and technological services. So if you look on their Facebook page, Commodore Engineering, in October 2020, they set up ittasks.it, a project management system this could very well be a rebranded white label system, or it could be one they've built from scratch, but I haven't looked into that. What's important is this business activity fits within their registered classes, but elsewhere on their timeline, this appears. Oh, <laughs> here we go again. And more recently, we've got mock-ups of products like this, the CP64, which reminds me somewhat of that handheld Thing being promoted on the 64 Indiegogo campaign a few years back. Did we ever get that? I don't, I don't think we did. Now there are a few videos of this mock-up, clearly with just a printed insert for a screen on their YouTube channel and whatnot, and it even appears on their website's homepage. There are also products such as the C-Tab 11, which is a tablet, and I presume it will be branded with Commodore logos, just like phones from Commodore Business Machines. I reached out to Luigi to try and get some more details. He told me that. I had my first Commodore VIC-20 when I was seven, and I've never stopped using the Commodore since. In 1997, I had a serious accident and I lost my sight. I was blind for two years. In 1999, a famous Italian surgeon managed to save my eye, and the first thing I saw was a Commodore 64, with which I did my rehabilitation. My mother told me, now that you have regained your sight, you have to become Commodore's boss. In 2016, my mother passed away, and I started the trademark acquisition procedure that I concluded for Italy and part of Europe. I have to finalize it for the rest of the world with some legal steps that are already underway. 
Our mission is to revive a historic brand that has given us so much happiness and taught us a lot. We have made an ARP software called the Commodore iTasks, and we would like to make four new video games. On the hardware front, we are selling the Commodore C-Tab 11 tablet, and hope to be able to sell the new Commodore CP64 console by 2021. In the future, we would like to make a new home computer and a new mobile phone. We sell our products mainly in Italy, but also happen to sell them in Europe. So it looks like we have a new challenger for the Commodore Crown. Anyway, Commodore Engineering, there's another company for you to look out for. So then, the final topic of investigation was to get in contact with the actual owner of the Commodore brand and get the lowdown. They stated in 2015 that no license or rights had been granted to anyone, so I needed to check this was still the case. Hello, is that Eugene? Yes, this is Eugene uh, speaking. Hello, it's uh, Pete. So I reached out to Eugene, representing Commodore Corporation, and he confirmed that Massimo's Commodore business machines have not been granted any licensing rights to the Commodore brand and that they have no rights, in his view, over the Commodore trademark. Eugene has in fact tried to speak to Massimo on several occasions, but cooperation has been somewhat difficult apparently. He confirmed that legal proceedings were ongoing, but it was made difficult due to the company's Italian base. Regarding Commodore Engineering and Simonetti, things are a bit different. Currently, Eugene told me that they are also operating without license, and so that's perhaps risky territory, but they have actually been in some discussions with Eugene to grant a license, so that's worth keeping an eye on. I also asked Eugene what the future plans for Commodore were, given that they really need to make use of their brand. He said that now the legal problems had been mostly freed up, they are currently licensing the name out for some projects, including software that will, quote, change consumer habits. Now, I don't know about you, but that doesn't sound too promising to me. And I've got to say, despite Commodore Corporation holding the legal rights to the name and the brand, I actually welcome the bit of excitement sparked into the world by Commodore Business Machines and Commodore Engineering. It's enough to stir things up, and at the very least get Commodore Corporation to actually do something. Because a well-loved brand name sitting, doing nothing, being licensed out for the minimum it needs to be the legal retention is boring, unfitting, and frankly frustrating. I respect these laws and trademark copyrights, but I also think there is a lot of nonsense and legal wrangling that's outdated, limiting, and heavily, heavily weighted against startups and the everyday man. So when a holdings company is just sitting on a trademark doing nothing with it, apart from stopping innovation from other people, that's annoying. I understand that, and I understand why people want a crack at making something from it. Likewise, though, it's also annoying if you get companies popping up trying to shift low-grade wares, or even worse, taking money without fulfilling orders. And I think we, as consumers, should be fully aware of the facts before going down that road. I hope that's not the case with Commodore Business Machines, or Commodore Engineering, or any other company that pops up going forward. I hope that something truly good comes out of the Commodore brand in the near future, and I totally welcome something from Commodore Corporation themselves, whether it's in-house or a licensed venture. Regardless, it's clear that trademark law and the Commodore brand are extremely contested and complex areas, and it really is a shame. It would be better if we could all just get along for the greater good, and just bring the Commodore name back to a decent product or enterprise, like the ZX Spectrum Next, one that's worthy of the brand and plays tribute to a name that we all know and love. Well, most of us do, anyway. But for now, I'm done with this. The rabbit hole has become too deep, my brain aches, and if you look at all the trademarks around the world who are all trying to register the Commodore name and do something with it, there's a lot of them. Some may be genuine, others may not. And that is definitely a story for another day, which I will never cover because this video has taken too much of my life already.
So in the meantime, I'm going to stick with my Mega 65. Because who needs a brand name when you already have the technology of the future? Seriously, this thing is great. It's everything I want. In the meantime, if you want to check out any of the businesses I've mentioned in this video, their social media accounts are below. Also, if you want to take a look at the references for this video, check out the related post on my website, where everything is linked and laid out for your viewing pleasure. Stay safe, folks. I've been Nostalgia Nerd. Until next time, toodaloo.